Hello and welcome to the Through the Pain Podcast. This is a place for chronic pain and chronic illness warriors to dare, dance, and dream through the pain. Hello and welcome to another great edition of the Through the Pain Podcast. I am your host, Dima Hendricks, and today we have Elsa Franco, who is a parent of a sickle cell warrior, um, and she is an epitome of a sickle cell parent, a wonderful caregiver, and um, yeah, so we're just going to chop it up and have a really important but painful conversation about being a caregiver with sickle cell disease. Welcome, Elsa. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I should probably grab tissue. You know, I'm an emotional person as it is. <laughs> but no, I'm so excited to be here. Thank you for having me. Um, let's just jump right in. Let's jump right in it. But um, bef- uh, recently, let's start with this. Recently, I seen you on social media expressing your concern. Let's just say concern and about things that were happening in the hospital setting. Um, And you voiced your opinion about an incident that happened at a popular pharmacy. Mm. Uh, Could you expand upon that and share with the audience what happened so we can just dive right in? Oh, this is a good one. Um, So that was last year. Um, So my son, so I will I'll kick, so my name is Elsa. I have, I'm a mom to a six-year-old warrior, a son with sickle cell SC. Um, He'd been pretty healthy for some time. Uh, Prior to COVID, uh, he had gone almost two years without a crisis. So uh, May of last year, he had a little crisis, which was like, okay, so we take him to the hospital. It ended up being just a day stay, um, got discharged and they sent us to the pharmacy to go pick up medicine. Now it's on a, I believe it was like a Friday night. So they, you know, asked which pharmacy it was. And just to backtrack a little, I used to work for a company that owned pharmacies. So I'd never been to any other pharmacy since he was born because of the company that I work for. And I pretty much knew people that I can just call and things would be ready for me. But because this was on a Friday night, um, the hospital was closing. So we we didn't go to the emergency room. It was actually the clinic at Tufts. So it was just before six o'clock, the pharmacy closed. No, actually it was a Saturday because they were closed early. Um, So call the pharmacy to ensure they were going to be open. And they were open, fine. I'm sending the script over there. What do I need? Nope, just come, everything will be all set. Get to the pharmacy. And um, so I'm leaving Tufts, which is about an hour from us and rushing to get to the pharmacy before six o'clock. I get there at 5.50 and the pharmacy was actually a woman of color. She was actually Nigerian, no less. And so automatically I get there. I'm like, hi, I called earlier about a prescription for my son. So the prescription was actually for, for um, I believe it was for morphine at, at that time because he was, he was in a lot of pain. As you guys may know, morphine is one of the drug of choices for sickle cell warriors in a, uh, in a pain. Um, so I asked her, she says, you know, she asked for my ID. I didn't have my ID in that moment because it's like, when a crisis hits, you're just going. You're not trying to see, well, do I have this? Do I have that? You're just going, you pick up what you can grab and you're you're just booking it to the hospital as quickly as you can. Didn't realize that my uh, license was not in my wallet. So I told her, ooh, I don't have it. What else will you take? And I happened to actually have a copy of my license, a picture of my license. So I asked her, can I, will you accept this picture? No. I need an ID. Very dismissive. I'm like, oh, I called from the hospital and you guys actually spoke to the nurse. Um, and I even, when I called to ensure that you'd receive the script, I asked what I needed. You said nothing. I need an ID. I said, okay. 
So Elsa, be calm, because now I'm feeling, all right, it's 10 minutes to six. So she says, step aside. Let me help the, the guy behind you. No problem. So I stepped aside. And while I, I'm on the side, I'm calling my mom to see if she's around. She doesn't live too far from me. My mom's not around. She's on her way to church. Called my sister. She's not around. No one's around. So I asked her, um, what else can I do? You'll have to find somebody with an ID. No problem. Not only did she help the guy, she went to drive through and took at least three or four customers in drive through came back to me at 10 past six. I'm still standing there waiting for calls and asking, um, waiting for her to tell me. So I said, ma'am, um, what's going on? I'm closed. I said, I'm sorry, excuse me. I I'm closed. You don't have an ID. You can't get the medicine. I said, ma'am, um, do you know what sickle cell is? I'm a pharmacist. Of course I know what sickle cell is. <laughs> okay. So you understand the severity of what can happen to my son if he doesn't get this next dose within a certain time frame. So you understand the possibilities of what can happen to him if he gets another crisis. So you do know that if he doesn't get the medication in time, it's just going to snowball into something else. She could not been colder and just completely dismissive. Um, so at that point, I kind of um, lost all sense of who I'm supposed to be in this moment in terms of like, there's no calm, there's no nothing. How could you be? I'm like, how could you be so cruel? Like, this is not for me. And at this time, he's only five years old. So it's like, there's a five-year-old kid and I'm, I had to leave him in the car to, cause I couldn't carry him. So at that point it's just dead weight. He's in pain. He can't walk. It's just dead weight. So the longer, if I'm taking him out the car seat and trying to carry him and you know, like you don't want to, you have to be gentle at that point. It's like, nope, I just need to run in and out. So it's like, but my son is also in the car. She was just so cold and so rude and pretty much didn't give me the medication, just told me I can go to hell pretty much. Um, she said that not in so many words, but she told me I can go do whatever I need to do, but you are not getting the script from here. So I left and I um, had to call the hospital and um, they were completely flabbergasted that someone did that, that a pharmacist did that. And then in calling around, they called several CVSs. There was one in Randolph that ended up giving us enough um, enough for that Saturday night and the Sunday. So he got like a, a full 24 hour, um, they did an emergency. So it's like same seat, same company that was able to be understanding yet this woman could not. And obviously I still didn't have my ID but this company, uh, this other branch was able to be understanding and they were able to provide that. But it was one of those situations that um, <laughs> softened my heart to, to what warriors go through as you get into the adult stage. Yeah, And it made me realize even your own people don't care sometimes. Right. And you don't know if it's a, because of the sickle cell, just lack of compassion, but it's like, it's a child. And, and I if just you wanted to highlight too, which you mentioned that this was a Nigerian woman. It's a Nigerian woman and sickle cell is a lot of children are born in Africa. Three, 300,000 children are born with sickle cell disease. And the highest rate of sickle cell disease is in Nigeria. So, Which is exactly why I pointed out that she's Nigerian. No right. Less. So I just wanted to kind of, I wanted to highlight that and state that statistic because she did, she, yes, she's a pharmacist and she didn't know better. And she should know better because in her land of origin is yeah. where sickle cell is doing the most damage. Yes. Um, and so, yes, she should know better. And two, you mentioned you went to another pharmacy, which was less than 10 minutes away because mm -hmm. we, we live in the same town. Yes. 
Less than 10 minutes away, you went to that pharmacy to receive the medication and was not able to go to the pharmacy that is in our city. Um, With it less than a mile from my home. Le right, right. And I, we've had a conversation before and I want the listeners to kind of get this. We had a conversation before as the prox about the proximity of, of um, for some reason, our city and our, our our city will not allow us to do certain things. Mm -hmm. um, our local hospital, um, they will not treat us. They will send us to Boston, uh, all like a, maybe twenty miles away, mm -hmm. <laughs> in order order to get care. We cannot get the medication without some type of struggle. And it's not just that specific. It's not that specific. Um, location either it's it's the town it, it could be Walgreens it could be CVS it could be Rite Aid it could be whatever we have issues getting access to our medication within this city um but like five minutes away 20 minutes away we're able to get that access and we don't I don't understand what the issue is yeah and, and every minute counts right every single minute counts and for us we've always been to tufts mm -hmm. from the day we found out that he had sickle cell and we got a hematologist like no i already knew the medicine or, or the medical field in our city is not the most had not been the most reputable mm -hmm. and our, because our hematologist is at tufts we'd always been to tufts so i would i we've just never been to a hospital here for the reasons that you've mentioned, but to know that you can't even get medicine close to home, it's a little troubling, right? A, a lot of troubling. Right. So was this your first experience of understanding what a sickle cell warrior would go through? Is this your, this is your first glimpse? That was the, absolutely. That was the first time, that was the first time that it actually started to learn what you guys really, really, really go through. Mm -hmm. um, so as I mentioned before, I mean, he's, he's had a few crises. So his first crisis was when he was about nine months old or so. Um, he, we were advised by the pediatrician to give him the flu shot. Um, as soon as he got the flu shot within 24 hours, he got the flu, which then triggered a crisis, <laughs> which if I had known, and at this point, I still was in my denial stage of sickle cell, to be very honest. Um, so, and, and then the pediatrician is actually someone who was very well versed with sickle cell. He has a, um, he, aside from being one of the partners at the practice that we go to, he actually has a medical company that does research for sickle cell. So I thought he was my guy, my advocate, like we're allies. And for the most part, we got along fairly well. Um, until, so it, 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 which is funny because everything kind of started going downhill from here. So he had that first crisis, didn't walk for two weeks. That was like, whoa, whoa, okay, this is serious. So now I can't just be in denial. I can't just be on the sidelines and ex just waiting for the pediatrician to tell me. But for someone who's also very well versed in sickle cell, I found it strange that he was constantly pushing drugs, pushing drugs. You should do this, you should do that. So in my research, and um, I'm a detective, especially when it comes to my kids. Um, so I started digging deeper into studying sickle cell, how it affects the body. But I did not, I did not know anyone with sickle cell, had not met not one person aside from my son, didn't really know much about sickle cell other than t Boz from mm -hmm. TLC had sickle cell but it's like, it was in passing, did not know any details. So I started digging more. Um, and then he went 
another six months or so. Yeah, so before his second birthday, he had another crisis, but that one, I knew what happened. He stressed himself out. He was playing, uh, so my mom wa uh, watched him for me while I worked because I didn't trust that. I liked him in a bubble so that I can, I can know when a crisis is coming. How did his day change? What happened? What's he eating? I needed to know all of that because now I became a student of sickle cell and I became a student of my child. Like I was learning from him really. Um, so he hadn't had too many crises, but we also got phenomenal care. Again, the pediatrician, we only saw him for physicals. Um, so anytime he wasn't sick other than a crisis, but anytime there was a fever elevated at 101, I'm calling the hematologist. I'm not calling the pediatrician. So for the first three years, it was great. I just went to Tufts. They took care of us, whether we were there overnight or for the most he's been in a hospital is like five days, which is like, that's, that's beautiful. a lot, it, it, which is great. But for us, it's like a lot, but then yeah. I'm learning. So I, then I started learning that there are kids that are there every month. Mm -hmm. There were people. So from three to five, he had been good. He went almost two years. So what, so it was crazy. So that same day that he had the crisis was the first time that I had to educate a, a physician, which for me, it was like, wait, you're a doctor. Like they did not know what to do um the, like the doctor came in and like grabbing his leg I'm like whoa whoa, whoa. Oh. What, what are you doing like you can't squeeze on it like he's screaming looking at me like he actually told me tell them to stop hurting me they're hurting me that's all a mother and me as a mother that's all I need to hear when my child is telling me to tell them to stop hurting me that's an issue for me so that day it just seemed to like spiral into something else so by three, I knew they're like, all right, I'm learning more and I don't like this. So I need to find a community because I need to learn from other parents. I had met one lady or one young woman um, at a sickle cell consortium probably the year prior. Um, she had her son, almost similar name to my child. I uh, think he was like two or three years old. Well, I found out yesterday. She was actually on one of the, the call yesterday. I'm like, oh my God, we hadn't. So he, they had similar, it's the same. He has sickle cell uh, SC as well. But then in connecting with her there, we had like a brief conversation and she had told me like her son had been in the hospital, like she was like, oh my God, your son has only had like this number of crisis. That's awesome. Like we're in a hospital every month or every other month or so. And he was having spleen issues. Um, so she had told me about that. So we exchanged numbers. We were in contact here and there, but every time we scheduled time to meet, either my son got sick or her son was sick. So like it never happened. And then like I switched phones and we just kind of lost contact. So I, it was like, oh my God, the one person that I had that I thought uh, I can create another ally, start my little community, that didn't happen. So in December of 20, and I hadn't met you yet. Um, so December, well, then I, I met Jackie, which is the, the director of uh, Greater Boston Sickle Cell Association. And so I helped more on the peripheral Yes. where you know anytime I can help them get any funding help with events I'm all there if I can attend something so I started to learn more as I attended events I've met a few people talked to warriors but nothing beyond like an event setting nothing beyond um just that one day one conversation so in 2020 um I clubhouse came about yeah so clubhouse and within a day or so. So what well, my goal was like, oh, there's people here. And I had studied what uh, Clubhouse was all about. And I found that I fight for sickle cell room. That first Sunday that I attended, my heart was just in complete. So I'm a total empath. And I've told you, like, I may cry today because 
once I started hearing from actual work, so my son had still, he couldn't tell me the last crisis he had prior to this one that we're discussing was when he was three. Mm -hmm. He didn't know what to tell him. All he can tell me is they're hurting me or my legs hurt. And I know that he can't walk or that he's limping and he's a super active child. Yes. So, which is one of the blessings. I'm not going to say a curse because he bounces off the wall all day. But that's one of the ways that we know there's something wrong with him. Like he literally, he gets up, he's a perky, happy, jumping kid all day long. The second we see that he's not moving for more than five minutes, it's like, uh, buddy, what's wrong with you? Mm. Are you okay? So that, I, I thank God for that. So in, in finding this sickle cell room and hearing from actual warriors, Dima broke my heart into pieces like broke my heart so would um, you say so would you say hearing our stories because I was on that on that clubhouse too would you say hearing your stories kind of evolved and opened your eyes to what would happen to him life, in the future what his life looks like yeah, yeah. Or what yeah. the potential of what his life will look like mm -hmm. so then it's not it's hearing from I believe like the age group was from like 18 to I think the oldest person was 60, which there was hope. So it's like, yes, there's it's more than the life expectancy that we've been told or that I hear on the Internet. But even in the Internet within like there wasn't a lot of info. Now there's a, lot, a ton more, but there wasn't a lot of information. And you certainly didn't find people or warriors that were openly sharing. You certainly didn't find parents that were openly sharing their experiences. So sitting in that room, it gave me hope, but it also broke my, broke my heart. Um, I could not believe the level of pain. I think one of the first warriors that actually so I heard two stories that I'm like oh my god one guy had mentioned that he had been shot before and that was a walk in the park in comparison to a crisis I'm sorry excuse me so that was one and another story that anyone who's a mom who's experienced any sort of labor pain uh, prior to an epidural or drugs of any kind, this may like hit you down there. Um, she said that it was her first pregnancy. She was in full labor, full labor. She thought it was an onset, not a full crisis. She thought she was just maybe a crisis was coming on had the baby on the floor because she was like, no, it's just a crisis. I'm not going to go to the hospital. I've had pain. I've had two kids and I've experienced labor pain. And so those two things, I was like, wow. So I kept going back. I, I missed church. I missed everything. I would sit there for three to four hours. Those were the best four hours of my week. I would wait all week just to go sit in that room to go hear the experiences of what you guys share. And then meeting you and hearing your story, all that you've been through, and you guys keep pushing through, pushing through the pain. It, so all of that leading up, so I did that from December to May, and, and it just started to see like, no, they can't, there's no way. There's got to be some exaggeration. People can't be that cruel that they treat people that way. But God said, I, 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 I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you how it feels. Because you never know until you're, you, you never, I guess, um, you never really fully understand someone's story or what someone goes through until you feel an inkling of it. And for me, I'm not the one going through the pain. So I can't even say that oh, I understand the pain, but to know that someone would allow my son to, to suffer in that way, it did something to me. It, it completely did something to me that um, 
I realized that day what my calling in life was. I'm like, uh, I've always been the one that roots for underdogs. I'm always the one I don't like when people mistreat other people. Um, I'm kind of like, a, 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 I keep to myself, but don't mistreat people in front of me. Um, I can have a big mouth. <laughs> and God said, well, this is how, uh, this is where I want you to use your words, use your resources, use your connection and just experience in general for the community. And from that point on, it's like, no, we need to do more because there's no way that, and it's not just the people here in our city that are suffering. It's not just my son. There's more than a million people worldwide that are suffering. We live in the land of the great in America. You'd think like we have the best of the medications. We have the best of the doctors, particularly here in Massachusetts. We're pretty lucky. We have some of the best hospitals. And to think that a hospital can't call a pharmacy and this pharmacist have a little bit of compassion for a five-year-old, it made me realize that um, <clears throat> this world is screwed, screwed up in some ways. And that there are so many people that don't have the advocate or someone or just the, the, the courage to speak up for themselves. So it, it was an interesting experience to, to say the least, for sure. Join us next week for part two of this painful conversation. For tools, merchandise, and additional information, log on to our website, www.throughthepain.org. This has been a Public Praise Media production.